Attention freelancers and solopreneurs. Freelancers and solopreneurs. You are tuning into the Remote CEO, a show that will help you scale your business, become the authority in your market, grow into a better leader, and create your remote empire. And now, your host, acclaimed business coach and entrepreneur, Deniero B. What's going on, CEOs? This is Deniero B, and you are listening to the Saturday interview episode of the Remote CEO Show. I always make sure to have the most interesting guests and ask them practical and actionable questions so that you can take that knowledge and scale your business with it. So if you do enjoy this podcast, I would love for you to leave a review on your podcast app. It only takes a couple of minutes and it will make a big difference. Now, don't forget that we do release the five-minute episodes every single day at around 6 a.m. Eastern time. So subscribe to the show and you will get bite-sized actionable content delivered for free to your device. Also, share this podcast with other fellow entrepreneurs, freelancers, and solopreneurs. You're on the rise, so it only makes sense that you share this journey with like-minded people. And don't forget that the more you talk about these topics with other people, the more you will understand them and make them part of your everyday life. And now, let's get started. What is going on, CEOs? The will be here with another episode of the Remote CEO Show. Today's guest is Susan Hamilton Meyer. Susan is a brand strategist, and visual artist, and founder of the Susan Meyer Studio. Susan has designed a set of processes and tools to get teams to problem solve more creatively. So today we're going to be talking about creativity, how to unlock creativity, and how to use it to thrive in the business world. I got so many questions, so without further ado, Susan, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you doing? Not bad, not bad. Thank you. So first off, thanks for being on the podcast today. And I want to start uh, the interview by asking you to talk a bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. Sure. So I studied art and art history uh, as my undergrad. Um, and then I, by chance, happened to see some corporate recruiters come to campus who were recruiting for management Consulting, strategic management consulting companies like BCG, McKinsey, Booz Allen. And I got interested in that because they were positioning themselves as uh, places where people who enjoyed solving puzzles or unlocking complex problems um, might find interesting. And I thought that sounded like me. And um, uh, not knowing exactly what I was going to do with my art major, I decided to give it a shot. And I really enjoyed it. And they provided me with an amazing education about the world of business, which I knew nothing about. And while I was there, I worked in a consumer goods practice largely. And we did a lot of interviews and focus groups and talking directly to consumers about um, what they, uh, how they interacted with the consumer brands that, that our companies, that our clients were representing. And I found that fascinating. And that's how I uh, fell in love with branding and discovered the whole discipline of branding, the notion of creating a relationship with your customers through your brand and the, you know, really intimate, deep, almost friendships that, that brands have with their constituents. Um, so fast forward 20 or so years, I've been working in brand strategy ever since. I continue working as a visual artist and since starting my own business uh, about, oh, it's almost 10 years ago now. Um, what I found to be really exciting um, is that I can actually use a lot of the tools and ideas um, that I work with as a visual artist to help my clients uh, work on their brand strategy. Super, super interesting. Now, I do want to talk about brand strategy, but before we get to that point, I wanted to ask you, how can someone break out of their bubble and explore new things? Like you're an artist, you ended up at Harvard. So I know there's a lot of listeners that are in that position in life, that moment in life, when they have to decide uh, which direction to go to. Do you have any suggestions? I guess my biggest suggestion is to keep an open mind. Uh, I think the, you know, the naivete of youth was helpful in my case. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, you know, even no matter how old you are, I think coming to something with an open mind and instead of a set of constraints, a perspective of possibility to say, even though I've never done that before, 
it might actually be something I'm good at or interested in, or even though my skill set doesn't exactly match the job description, maybe some of the things that I've done in the past are relevant and might even add a fresh perspective to what, uh, what they're looking for. Very interesting. Very interesting. Listen, let's talk about the brand strategy and what exactly do you mean when you talk about brand strategy? Why do you find it? Uh, there's, why do you find that there's some similarities between what you were doing before and what you do now? Sure. I'm glad you asked me about the terminology because I think, uh, both of those words, brand and strategy, can mean so many different things and do mean so many different things to different people. Um, so I'll start by giving you, you know, my perspective, or at least in the work that I do, what those mean. So strategy, I think of as um, making a plan or a roadmap for where you want to go, having a vision. I use that word a lot. Um, in fact, what I what I call my deliverable to my clients is a brand vision. So I can encourage them to think ahead farther into the future than they might imagine when they first come to me saying, oh, I need help with my branding, um, and then work backwards from there to say, what is, it, what is it gonna take me to get to that future vision? And so that allows them to open their minds um, and think a little bit bigger than they might have otherwise, and then we can plot the course to how you're gonna get there. Um, now there's lots of things that go into strategy, um, like more operational things or financial things that I don't particularly deal with in my business, but strategy encompasses all of those things. My focus being on brand strategy, I really look at what the meaning of the brand is um, that you're working with. That brand might be you. So I work with um, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, uh, where or new businesses where the founder's experience is really what the core of the brand is, all the way through to huge companies you know, multi-billion dollar multinational companies that have hundreds of brands that they're working with, and those brands have many years of equity behind them. But really the rules are the same, right? Your brand has a relationship with its customers, whether they're consumers or business to business um, or nonprofits, they have a relationship with that brand. They have expectations of that relationship in the same way that if you and I are friends, We've made a promise to each other to be, you know, to trust each other, to be loyal to each other. You know, we each sort of maybe tacitly in the case of a friendship, but we bring something to the table. Maybe you're the funny one or I'm the creative one or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Brands do the same thing, you know, and they say, I'm going to always show up consistently with this promise. I'm going to be healthy. Um, I'm going to, you know, have some social purpose or whatever it is that your positioning is around. And so I help companies with, um, figuring out what that is, that's their brand DNA, that, that's based in their values and in their experience and credentials that they can offer to um, whoever it is that they serve. Super interesting. So you're talking about you work with uh, just businesses as small as a solopreneur up to like multi-billion dollar businesses. And the thing that I just came to mind is the fact that even if a brand's been around for a long time, it doesn't necessarily mean that they know their exact purpose or at least can it change over time? And what do you fit your consulting and your strategy when we're looking at a business that's already been around for a while? Yeah, that's an interesting one, right? Because if you're talking about a brand like I've done a lot of work in soft drinks and, you know, brands like Pepsi, Pepsi or Coca-Cola um, have so much equity, almost universal awareness and a very clear sort of positioning in consumers' minds. So when they go out to do a refresh, um, they have to be really careful not to walk away from any of that goodwill and good relationship yeah. that they're working with. And that's true of much smaller brands as well. You've built something, you want to build upon it and not tear it down. Even as, you know, in life, we all must move forward. So there's always going to be, no matter how well established you are, no matter how profitable you are and how well you're doing, um, you're always going to come back periodically to your brand to refresh and make sure that it continues to be relevant or maybe to innovate, think about new markets that you could serve or new products that you could offer underneath that brand. Um, so, but it, there are unique challenges depending on where you are in the life cycle. And for a more established brand, one of those challenges is remaining true to your heritage while looking forward um, and, and being aware of what's happening currently in your context that, um, you know, that you're going to need to incorporate as you evolve. Whereas when you're a, a, a startup or early, just earlier in the life cycle, a small company, you have more leeway, but you're doing more thinking about 
you know, who are we? You know, what do we stand for? What are our values? Who are our customers and what do they care about? Whereas a, a more established brand knows that stuff a little bit better. For sure, for sure. So I wanted to really understand uh, the scope of your work. So um, let's say you just got a new client. What is your process from the onboarding on? Yeah, so we start always with a kind of foundations, like let's look at everything you've got background information, you know, relatively recent, you know, what are the communication touch points that you have out there in the world um, or internally. <clears throat> so I'll look through whatever PowerPoint decks you have, your investor deck, your sales deck, all of your online um, materials, social media, website, et cetera, all the ways that you are communicating who you are to the world. Um, and then uh, do a, I do a, usually a kickoff meeting based on that with the core team members who are going to be working on the project to get their voiceover to all of it, right? So you and I can look at the materials and make our own assessment, but the people who are close to the brand might actually have intended something different with those materials or have some other information about, well, there's this you know, strategic initiative from corporate, which we need to, you know, make sure we're aware of as we go forward, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes there's lack of alignment, right? If it's a, you know, if there's a team of multiple people, they might not all have the same perspective. So the first part is getting everybody on the same page and getting up to speed on what it is that we're dealing with, what equity we do have in that brand, what we know about our customers and what we don't know, what the, you know, challenges are that we're facing. Um, and then we'll go into um, making some hypotheses about mm -hmm. what our brand stands for, sort of who we are and who they are, right? So, so what does our brand stand for? What are our brand values and pillars? And what do we think the attributes of our brand are that are appealing to our customers um, and that, you know, really drive their purchasing decisions? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, so we know what we think. And that may be based on previous actual research and talking to customers, and it may not. Um, and then I think a very important part of the process is to actually go out and listen to customers. And for a larger organization with a big budget, that can be, you know, focus groups around the world, but it definitely doesn't have to be. It can be a quick, you know, finger in the wind survey, right? Or a couple of phone calls with key clients, depending on the way that the business is organized to hear from, you know, in their words, what they think is the positioning of your brand, what they think, how they think you fit into the landscape of other competitors, who they, you know, what are the attributes that from their perspective actually drive that relationship, what makes them want to purchase, what makes them loyal to your brand. And frequently our hypothesis is slightly wrong, right? Like what we think we're doing that's important to them or what we think, you know, the precious elements of our brand. And sometimes that's even, you know, like we think the color purple is the most important thing. And everybody thinks of us when they see purple and it turns out people are like, Oh, no. I thought you guys were blue. You know, <laughs> so it's really, <laughs> sure. really enlightening to talk to customers and say, and, and hear in their words, what's important to them. And often it's something a little deeper, like, we think that the features of our light bulb are what's important, you know, because it burns brighter or it burns longer. And actually what the customers are saying is, um, you know, I don't really care so much about light bulbs, but I do care about light and creating an environment and an experience with light in my home. And that's a really big insight, right? In terms of how you're going to talk about your product. If it's a light bulb, maybe you evolve from talking about your product in terms of those quantitative measures that the engineers know are important to create that experience. And you shift toward talking about the experience that, that your consumers are actually after. For sure. For sure. So many follow-up questions I have right now. One of them, for example, is the fact that I have a lot of solopreneurs and we're talking about them earlier in the conversation. I had a lot of solopreneurs that are scaling a business and they were trying to build personal brands as well as grow their brand. In that situation, do you have maybe a tip or two to guide people in the right direction? Should they focus more on building a brand, a standalone brand, or should they also take care of their personal brand alongside the, their, their business? Yeah, the first thing I would say is that consistency is important. 
Now, of course, it's absolutely fine to have your own individual identity as a human being that's separate and distinct from the identity of your company, but you are going to want to, from time to time, make sure that the, the message and the persona, especially if your business is very much branded around the founder, um, mm. you want to make sure that the message is consistent and the face and the, the, the tone of voice that you're putting forward is consistent. Um, the next thing that I would say is um, you want to think about as you build that brand around the founder, um, you know, what are the, what are the sort of criteria or credentials um, that are important to your, to your constituents? So in your, in your personal brand, you can talk about fly fishing and breeding dogs and all this stuff that you do. And that's cool. And that's interesting for those who actually want to get to know you. And those might be your, my customers might be interested in that, but on your professional brand, you're going to want to stick to stuff that's more universally relevant um, mm -hmm. to uh, to the business that you're running um, and to the people who are who are um, purchasing your service. And the final thing I would say is um, the maybe this is a no brainer, but sometimes it needs to be reset. Authenticity is important. Don't try to be yes. anybody that you're not. Um, you don't have to show everybody everything about you, but what you do show about you should be true um, and, and, uh, and not a made up story. For sure, 100%. So I wanted to ask you, what makes for a really successful project once you're done your job? Because I work, I have a digital marketing agency and I specialize in Facebook and Google ads and I know that I can pull reports at the end of the month, I can show the ROI and that's what I'm, you know, um, graded on in a way. So like, what makes for a really successful project in your field? I'm jealous of you. <laughs> <laughs> you have those quantitative metrics you can apply. Uh, yeah, it's a little softer, right, in, in branding. So my deliverables are things like a strategy deck or, you know, a logo and a tagline. And it's a little harder to say, okay, well, we did that piece of work. Um, and then the next quarter, sales saw a big bump. And we can take all the credit for it. Mm -hmm. I mean... We can't, but what we do rely on more is feedback from, from our customers. So mm -hmm. when they say um, to me, you know, I want you to know that your, that that sales deck that you created for our team based on the positioning work that we did got amazing feedback from customers and they said it was different from stuff they had seen before and our sales team said it helped them actually convert sales that's where we know that we have done the job and that that jump in sales in the next quarter was at least in part due to the work that we did. Um, but it's not as quantitative as, uh, as some other types of work. No, for sure. But at the end of the day, I know for a fact that when I run ads to a store or just a business that it's not branded correctly, I don't get almost any sales. I think it's in a thousand clicks and it happened in the past we sent amazing cheap clicks, uh, quote unquote, and nothing, just like, you know, nothing was happening. And then, you know, my client realized that they need to work on branding. And so we, sometimes these are actually the most important steps that you need to take before you use, you know, uh, paid ads as a megaphone almost, right? That's something I see a lot is that, you know, of course everyone, especially as a growing business is, is anxious to leap into action and get their social media strategy going and put stuff out there. Um, and I see a lot of times this unfortunate uh, cycle where, or even design their, design their stuff, like design their um, logo and their website. And, and then they'll, and then they'll come work with somebody like me and they'll say, oh, actually, <laughs> actually my brand is about peace or, you know, like tranquility. And I've just made all of this, uh, you know, content and design around excitement and energy. And I maybe need to redo like... all the work I just did, right? <laughs> so um, it is where, you know, Sometimes it has to happen in tandem, but I definitely encourage people not to jump straight into the design and the social media and the advertising before you've done that piece of critical thinking about who you are as a brand. For sure, for sure. Listen, I want to ask you, why is it so important to integrate creativity at work, especially in jobs that are not traditionally considered creative? 
Well, for starters, it makes your work much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Absolutely. I mean, you know, everything is about how we frame it or how we think about it. And if I'm a you know bookkeeper and I think of my job as being boring, I'm not going to have a great time in my job and I'm probably not going to be very good at it. But if I'm a bookkeeper or an accountant, and I actually know a fair number of them who love their work and they are incredibly creative people. They may not be painters or musicians, mm -hmm. but there's lots of ways to be creative. And so I think going in with an attitude of create, like how, how can I express myself in this work or how can I kind of find an interesting angle or what can I find exciting about this work that lights me up? That's what I mean by creativity really. Yes. So to find that creative spark in whatever it is you do. And if you can't find it at all in what you're doing, then you're probably not doing the right thing for you. Right. For sure. For sure. That's so true because a lot of people think about creativity as just, you know, art in general, whether it's visual art or music, but creative thinking can uh, be applied to any type of uh, job, I guess, right? Actually, you brought up right now uh, bookkeeping. Uh, you know that uh, one of my bookkeepers was actually talking about different ways that they were going to enter data in the computer when I give them a bunch of papers once and they didn't know what to do. And honestly, I know that those people are the ones that actually enjoy the work a lot more than the ones that just go through the motions. So, so I want to ask you, what are your future plans with the business? Uh, do you have anything exciting happening coming up? I love running my company and so I am not going anywhere from here okay. in terms of that anytime soon. Um, you know, when I first started the business and I, people may uh, recognize this, this process in their own small businesses, you start out and first you go, well, people pay me to do this? Is this going to work at all? And then suddenly you get some clients and you have some revenue and you're like, wow, this is exciting. And you'll take any work that comes your way of any kind. And then a few years in, you're like, well, maybe I should, you know, just stop doing like anything. Like there's some stuff I enjoy more and I'm better at and other stuff that less so. So you start to go, okay, where should I focus? And it's a little scary because nobody likes turning away money or, you know, but you know focusing and then it turns out that that actually brings you more work because people actually understand who you are and why they should come to you um and then i would say maybe uh six or seven years in i did a real like re you know uh reflection on am i doing this because it was you know there were lifestyle reasons why I started my own business for sure. You know, just for me personally, it was, it was a, a great work-life balance as a parent of young children. Suddenly my children are no longer so young. I do have the freedom to work wherever I want and travel for work. So I wanted to um, just take stock of whether I was doing what I was doing because it was fun and easy and, you know, it worked with my lifestyle or whether this was really my calling and what I wanted to do as a career. And I think that, you know, the sort of six months or so that I spent, you know, working with coaches and doing a career assessment and evaluating job offers that were coming my way um, and deciding very much that this was absolutely the right fit for me. I'm very much wired as an entrepreneur. I get a lot of value and purpose out of the work that I do, helping people grow their businesses um, was really valuable that I had questioned it and then come up with the answer that, you know, I'm consciously making this choice to be doing what I'm doing. That's super cool. Honestly, I uh, understand that moment when you just talked about uh, you were taking on as much work as you could at the beginning and then you were like, wait a minute. Sometimes one of the best thing I think I've ever done was actually to raise my prices, get less clients, but then really get the clients that, as you said, understand the value in what you do and that's the most important thing. Listen, um, Susan, I wanted to thank you for being on the show today and I know that my listeners want to know more about you. So where can people find you? Go to electrifyyourwork.com, and from there, you can reach all my website, social media, all that good stuff. Perfect. Thank you so much, Susan, and I look forward to having you back on the show in the future. Great. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Thank you. And this is it for today, CEOs. Thanks for staying with us until the end. Can I ask you a big favor? Can you please leave a review? I know the podcast app is not super straightforward. So if you don't know how to leave a review, just DM me on Instagram at B. 
D-E-N-I-E-R-O-B. And I will send you the direct link to the review section. And to show you my appreciation, I will answer any business question you ask me during that conversation. So thank you again, and I will talk to you again soon.